Hello. Hi. <laughs> uh, my name is Marina, and welcome on the session How to Use Your Strengths to Become a Great Leader. So, how was your DrupalCon so far? Good? Bad? Good. Great. Uh, I'm really happy to see you here. I'm really happy to stay here and deliver this presentation. Uh, it's all, each and every time for me is an amazing experience, and I'm really grateful for the Drupal community to have a chance actually to stay here. Me, the girl from the middle of nowhere, has the opportunity to talk about things that really matter to me. It's just amazing. So let's give a huge round of applause to Drupal community and to each one of us. Thank you. Uh, I guess it would be fair if I introduce myself first before I start with my content for you to have an idea why have I chosen this topic and actually what experience I have about it. So my name is Marina and I come from Russia, uh, quite a small city somewhere in, in the middle of Siberia. And I work there in the company DCI Solutions and I'm responsible for organizational development. So um, during my professional experience, I've been a team member of many teams and I also had uh, an honor to lead several of them. And through each and every of those experiences, I somehow reinvented myself to find out what kind of leader is needed to lead the team to great success. But nothing is good from the first time sometimes, so my first membership experience was a failure. So I was like this little puppy uh, in a new team. I didn't know what to do, I didn't know uh, how to do it, whom to ask. So back then, it was the second or third year of university, I guess, I joined the uh, youth, international youth NGO, uh, which was about doing um, international student exchange. So I, uh, the same as other newbies in this team, were assigned to uh, different students from different cities, and I was supposed to find an internship for them. But I didn't know how to do this, I didn't know how the platform of this searching for internship works. So uh, actually, the team leader of our team didn't do that much bonding of us, so I didn't know, uh, is it okay to approach someone else? Is it okay to ask for help? And so I was really confused at that time, but somehow I managed to find an internship for this girl, and I understand I wanted to keep going to invest more in my self-development, and I joined another team. So if this time I was a team member of a team of a local chapter of international organization, so next step was to be in a team that led this local chapter of this international organization. And that was a completely different experience because uh, from the first days of this team, the leader of it uh, treated us completely differently. She treated us as uh, unique personalities. She helped us through all the processes. She helped us to get to know each other. She helped us to trust each other. So we met each week and we talked about every successes and what, most importantly, all the failures we had. So we shared it openly. And uh, if, uh, when we started this experience, our local chapter wasn't even recognized by the capital uh, local chapter. So we, were, we weren't even on the map of our organization that small we were at that time. But uh, in a year, we were that dedicated, we were so, that bonded that we managed to become the best local chapter in our country. And it was, like, when we did it, we didn't believe it ourselves because we were just, you know, third year students knowing nothing about how to deal with this stuff. But um, the attitude that the that leader brought to our team changed everything. So she helped us understand how we can unleash our own potential while achieving our common goals. And that brought uh, us a very strong commitment towards achieve, achieving them. And that we did. So later on, as I was moving on with my career, I started to analyze the previous experience I had. I started to think, what was the difference between those two different approaches to managing a team? And I understood for myself that uh, I call it value-based uh, team management works better. So if in the first team, uh, the manager were more of uh, delegating tasks and putting the project's goals above our personal goals, so on the second team, the leader behaved differently. So she helped us uh, to connect our personal goals, our personal values to the project goals. And that uh, bonded us, that made us a really strong team so we could benefit from our common strengths together. So uh, I was digging deeper on this value-based approach and tried many methodologies, many uh, techniques in my next teams and so on. And I uh, realized uh, that there are actually two main components of becoming a good leader. 
And the first one is self-assessment and development. Why? Because I do believe that the true leader should start from the, their selves. So you should know who you are and where you go before leading others somewhere. It's at least honest. Because if you're leading someone somewhere without knowing where you're going yourself, so you're all lost, you know? And uh, so that is the first step. And then when you are done with your self-assessment, uh, go further to self-development because you can actually become, some, uh, become better at some points of leadership, of team uh, management, ex management experience to become a better leader for your team. So when you're done with this, uh, it's uh, important to be able to transmit your values, transmit your vision to other people. And therefore, the second component is communication. So if you're able to communicate properly with your team members, with other people, to share your values, to share your goals, to unite people by them, uh, you're a leader. But if you're a great personality, a great professional, but you're not able to communicate with different people, you cannot find the right approach to different people. So it will be very difficult for you to create a bonded, uh, good team, at least in my opinion. So during this presentation, we will cover those two points with our agenda. And we will start with golden circle model designed by Simon Sinek. It will help us understand why we, we want to be leaders. Then we will move on to our uh, you know, natural features, natural strengths and weaknesses with PAI leadership styles model that will help us understand which leadership styles exist and what uh, uh, which of them we demonstrate. Then we will do some self-assessment and see how we can communicate with representatives of different styles. Right? So I have introduced myself. I have introduced our agenda. So I really want to know whom we have here. Is it okay for me to ask if we have any developers in the room? Can you please wave? Yeah, that's amazing. Can we, uh, do we have project managers maybe? Okay, good. Can we, do we have? <laughs> Uh, marketing managers, good, HR managers, yeah, one, one shy HR manager, great. Uh, whom do I mean? CEOs, <laughs> nice, uh, anyone, any, uh, designers, I forgot designers, oh, yeah, we got one, great, I really hope that the session will be helpful for you somehow, uh, and um, before we start, um, if I'm starting speaking too fast or not understandable, it's clearly heard that I'm not a native English speaker. So please don't hesitate to raise your hand and slow me down or just ask to repeat something. It's okay, I really want this hour to be productive and efficient for you and for me as well. So if something goes wrong, just let me know. Well, let's start with the golden circle model. Uh, it is designed by Simon Sinek. It answers to three main questions that can you, uh, that help uh, you assess yourself. Has anyone heard about this model before? Yeah, the, the designer, right? <laughs> Great. Uh, <laughs> so uh, this model answers three, to three main questions. Why, how, and what? So in terms of doing something, what's more important? Why, why are you doing this? How are you going to do this? Or what are you going to do, actually? So who is for why? Who thinks that why are you doing things is the most important? Uh huh. Thank you. Uh, who thinks that how are you going to do this is the most important? No. <laughs> and who thinks that what are you going to do is the most important? Okay. Thanks. Thank you for participating in my small interactions. Uh, but I'm sorry to disappoint you, but you all are wrong. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the m main point is that uh, you need to apply two main principles to this model to make it work. And the first principle is balance. So you need to have all three questions. Yes, it is as easy as this. So you need to answer all these three questions in order to become an influential leader. So if you know why you do things, but you don't know what are you doing, you won't be able to channel your personal values, your personal vision to your activities, and people won't understand who, what kind of person you are. And on the other hand, if you know what you do, but you don't know why, you still miss this connection and people won't understand who you are out of what you do. 
Uh, and uh, Simon Sinek claims that if you have answers to all those three questions, you will be able to, have, to build this strong connection between your personal values and your actions. And that will help you to surround yourself with like-minded people uh, who will uh, join you because of who you are, because of why you do things. Uh, and this is what he calls influential leadership. And the second principle of this model is order. So you should always start from why. So in this terms, those who rose hands on why were partially right, because this is the first touch point with this model. This is the first question you should ask yourself. Why are you doing this, really? So why is it important? Why is it that valuable to you, what uh, mm, it brings to your life? So if to finalize, you should always have the clarity of why, where why is the set of your personal beliefs, your personal values, then you need move, to move on and find your discipline of how, where how are the concrete steps to realize your why. And finally, you need to have consistency of what, where what, are, uh, what is uh, some tangible results, some physical manifestation, uh, manifestations of your why in the real world. So having answers, answered all those three questions, you will be able to uh, uh, reflect yourself to your activities and build a team uh, who share common values. But unfortunately nowadays life is so fast and people don't really have time to stop and think about those things. And usually if you ask others, like, uh, tell me something about yourself, people answer something like, I study in this university, I work in this company, I do this, I have this kind of hobby, and that's it. They usually not, sharing, uh, not share with you why this is it's important to them, why, they, uh, why have they chosen this job, why have they chosen this hobby, and so on. Um, but actually, the point is that people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And uh, bonding people by why will build much stronger commitment, much stronger connection uh, among your team members. So I think this quote is very true. Uh, so, does anyone know their why already? Actually, uh, it's hard at first at least answer this question, but it's okay. So if you're struggling, I suggest you to answer two more questions that will help you to find your why, to understand what your why is. And the first question is, what would you do if you have unlimited amount of money? So just imagine money is not an issue anymore at all and think about the list of things that you would do then. And once you come up with a list of things uh, that you would do if you have unlimited amount of money, then at the same day or on another day to clear your mind, think about the list of things that you would do even if you're not paid for it. So what are you that passionate about that you would do it no matter what? And then look at those lists and think what is similar uh, among all those activities. What uh, do they have in common? And then imagine yourself doing those things and think about what you feel, what, uh, what value those activities bring to your life. This might be not the direct answer to your why, but this will be a source of insight to you to find it. And yeah, I find my why the hard way. So uh, as I shared with you, I was a member of this NGO uh, I, was, uh, I was there for four or five years or so, and you cannot be a member of NGO without knowing why you're there. So it's an NGO, you're not paid for it. That's why if you join it, if you're, it is your conscious choice. So if you join any NGO, you want to contribute to its mission. And the mission of our NGO was to uh, make uh, my country, Russia, a better place. And I did want to contribute to this mission because I want my country to be a better country. I want my children to be raised in the better world. And I w really wanted to contribute to this mission. And therefore, uh, during those four or five, I don't really remember, years, it wasn't a question to me why I'm doing this. I knew why I'm doing this. But then, uh, since it's youth and student organization, then I finished my university and uh, uh, started working in the commercial company. And at first it was very interesting, everything was new. First half of the year was very overwhelming, I really loved it. But then I found myself not knowing why I'm there anymore. So tasks were like too easy for me. I didn't feel like I'm really bringing uh, some value to this company and I didn't feel that the work in this company brings value to myself. So I didn't really s um, 
uh, see the point of me being there anymore. But and that was really unusual and uh, let's say unnatural to me, not knowing my why. I didn't know how. How can I not answer this question about myself? I'm the one who who is supposed to know myself, right? But uh, so I was struggling for months. I was trying to push this why out of myself, but it didn't uh, appear anyhow. And then, uh, even without knowing about this model of Simon Sinek, I somehow made up a list of things that I'm really that I really enjoy doing. And I included there all the things in my life that really brought me happiness and fulfillment. I included there the educational events that I created uh, when, when I was in university. The, brand of international internships that I launched when I was working in this NGO. All the sessions that I prepared and delivered, even my weird hobbies such as home gardening, baking and knitting and stuff like this. And I was looking at this list and thinking, why? <laughs> why I love doing all those things? And then, uh, simply but not easy, one statement came to my mind. I realized that all those uh, things are united by the one process of creation of doing something out of nothing, of like fixing something that isn't working properly. And I just really realized that, yes, this is it. So I remembered myself standing on the stage of the event uh, that was the idea of my mind, in my mind, that uh, became the actual event that 200 people attended. And I was standing on the stage and thinking, wow, I did something that never existed before. It's so cool. and. Uh, it really brought me fulfillment. I got really motivational out of it and I uh, was ready to do even more. And I uh, know that uh, I can create much more value for others if I'm in this inspired state. So I really wanted my everyday job to become something like this. And I put effort to uh, uh, change my job description a little to fit it, to uh, make it more, uh, to make it fit more my why. And so as I told you in the beginning, I'm doing organizational development, which literally means that I create business processes that haven't existed before, or I fix business processes that aren't working properly. So that's how finding my why helped me in my everyday life. And I hope that if you will answer this question, anytime even you will need to answer uh, to decide whether to do something or no, knowing your why will be much easier to you to understand what it will bring to you and what can you give back. So. Uh, that's about the, this kind of personal values assessment part. And now let's talk about how uh, you can uh, channel your vision to your team, what, uh, how to become this leader that can really uh, lead the team to the great success, what role the leader should play. And we're moving closer to this PAY leadership styles model. It, it is designed by uh, Dr. Adizes. Uh, he's an amazing scientist. He's an amazing book writer. I really enjoyed reading his works and watching his videos. And uh, I want him to introduce to you the role of the leader because I'm sure after watching the video, you will like him too. What is a leader? Please look at my hand. Do you see that the hand is five different fingers? Five different fingers. And we need the five different fingers in order to get a hand. Because every finger does something different than another finger. If you had five fingers, like the pointing finger, would you have a good hand? This is the best finger there is. No, you will not have a good hand. Because you will need things that this finger can do that this finger cannot do. Now in another segment I also told you that in the Middle East, when the five fingers are together, that's called a hamsa, that's a blessing. When the five fingers are separate, that's a curse. So if you put it in front of somebody's face, five fingers like this, you're actually cursing them. What is the difference between a blessing and a curse? Probably two inches. Are we different and together? That's a blessing. Or are we different and separate? That's a curse. So what is the role of leadership then? Look at my hand. Which finger is the most important one? This one. You know why? Because the thumb is what makes, is the only finger that works with every other finger. If you don't have a thumb, you don't have a hand. 
As a matter of fact, if you, you lost your thumb by some accident, a surgeon will have to break your healthy finger to make it perform like a thumb so that you can have a hand. You know what the leadership is? Here is the title of my future book or a chapter in my present book. Being a leader is being a thumb. Make us work together. Make our differences work as a hand. Yeah. <laughs> so I told you, he's amazing. Uh, yeah, so the role of the leader is to act like a thumb to make different people to work together. And at this is what we will understand under the role of the leader, at least within this session. So, uh, but what it takes to make different people to work together? Uh, uh, that means that you need to appreciate differences. And that is very important, stuff, uh, important step of becoming a leader, to appreciate each other's differences. Because the communication of people with different points of view can uh, lead to amazing ideas and efficient ways to realize them. But it only applies to constructive conflict. So uh, constructive conflicts are things that actually drive an organization to evolve, to change, and develop. And uh, again, the quote of Dr. Adizis, if all of people think alike, none of them is thinking too hard. Right? So if you agree with everybody all the time, you don't move forward, you don't go any further, you don't evolve. You're just stuck in one place. Actually, is it okay? To, how do you pronounce the name of, the, of Dr. Adizis? So I tried to Google it, and I didn't find it in English at all. So in Russian, we say it's hack. So it's the same? Okay. So. Because I was really confused because I didn't, I couldn't Google something. Why? <laughs> yeah. So we were talking about constructive conflicts. Uh, so that is the source of evolution. Uh, but unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't know, destructive conflicts happen as well. And that is the time when the leader should step up and to show the team how powerful and resultative constructive conflicts uh, can be. Um, but there is the only way to make this disagreeing process not exhausting and destructive is to create the atmosphere of trust and respect. And when respect is, uh, if to rephrase of Kant, is the recognition of the right of the other person to think differently, and trust is being 100% sure that each and every time other team members do anything to contribute to your common goals. So, to sum it up, the role of the leader is to act like a thumb to, make, to bring different people to work together in the atmosphere of trust and respect. So what are those PAI leadership styles are? Again, the question, has anyone heard about this model? Good. <laughs> okay, so this is an acronym where P stands for producer, A stands for administrator, E stands for entrepreneur, and I for integrator. Uh, let's see uh, what are those styles in more details. So the first role of the organization is to produce results. So you need to produce some product or service to offer to your customers, and that, uh, the producer is responsible to this. And for this, producer is a very hard-working person. Producers are always, uh, they always have a lot of tasks. They work from very early morning to the midnight every day, and they really can produce good results uh, under this pressure. But sometimes being that snowed under work, they lack the big picture. They don't see how their uh, current tasks uh, contribute to the final company's goal. But on the other hand, they're very responsible. They um, really accurate, uh, they do every task and they try to make it by deadline, and they tend to control everything, and sometimes they become uh, some kinds of control freaks because they don't trust their team members some bigger tasks because they don't know whether they will do this fine. Uh, but So they delegate some minor things and they still check it all. So therefore, the more team members in the producer's team, the more work for the producer because anyway, uh, he does something like this. Uh, it's because producers don't really know how to manage the team. Producers think that all education, team buildings, and personal talks are the distraction from work. 
And that's why the team members of the producer don't develop themselves. They cannot do bigger tasks. The producer can delegate the bigger tasks and this endless circle uh, uh, goes over and over. And producers are ambitious. They know what results they need to achieve and they won't uh, uh, accept any smaller things. So that's about the producer. The next hero is administrator. Administrator, uh, the administering role is <laughs> about how things are done. So administrators are responsible, are responsible for uh, things being controlled, organized, structured, and stuff like this. And for this purpose, administrators have strong analytical skills. Uh, they are great at working with data. They can analyze it, they can draw right conclusions, and they really love doing this. They are also very meticulous when they are working with numbers. They check it, they double check it, they never do any mistakes because they are very accurate at this point. They have steady and structured approach. They do first thing first, second, second thing second, never a different order. And therefore, sometimes they put procedures over efficiency. So even though uh, their team members might come up with some efficient way to do something, they won't allow to start doing this until uh, the team members will do instructions in, of this process, of this new process. And, uh, but sometimes market situation is changing very fast and the company doesn't really have time to write instructions for each and every new process. And in these terms, uh, slow decision-making process of the administrator can be uh, not the good point for the company. Um, uh, for the company. Yeah. So the administrator has the slow decision-making process because they, really, uh, they always need more data. So when the administrator needs to decide something, they require more data and then even more data. And only after that they maybe decide or request more data. So, and they bound team with too many rules. So after some time, team members will come up with new ideas and suggest them, but they will stop soon because they will know that right after they create something new, they will need to write instructions for this. Next guy, <laughs> next um, <laughs> style right, is an entrepreneur. Uh, entrepreneur in role helps organization to successfully adapt to change. And for this, entrepreneurs really full of ideas. They pop up with ideas all the time. They pop up with ideas while popping up with ideas. Really, they have many of them. They're really innovative and they know how to bring some new things to organization. But the point is they don't really filter those ideas. They consider all of their ideas as the most brilliant ones. And they actually expect the team members be on these ideas right after they say them. Uh, but uh, Team members don't really do this because they never know whether it was the final idea or <laughs> it will change in the next five minutes. So uh, as uh, entrepreneurs think that their ideas are the most brilliant ones, they don't really listen to others because they're really scared that someone else will, be, uh, will create something even better than they did. Uh, but they have strategic insights, so they are really good at creating strategies. They somehow a little bit foresee the future and can distinguish opportunities from threats. And that is the only style that can handle big risks, because entrepreneurs are good at working in very unstructured conditions and in certain situations. They are really fine with uh, changing environments and so on. But they have implementation issues. So they like creating strategies and popping up with ideas. They don't like implementing them. And therefore, entrepreneurs should remember that sometimes a mediocre but implemented idea is better than the most brilliant one but never implemented. And the final style we have is the integrator. So integrating a role creates, it helps to create the bonded team that um, makes organization last during the long term and work efficiently. So uh, for this purpose, integrators have strong empathy. They are really good at working with different people. They are really good at working with uh, and finding approach to different people. So effective communications is their main feature. And those other guys that create the atmosphere of trust and respect that we were talking about. But <laughs> of course, there are some buts. So the backfire of the integrator's empathy is that they are really scared of conflicts, even of the constructive ones. So they are constantly searching for a compromise and um, it slows up their decision-making process. 
So they need to know each and everyone's opinion before deciding something. But sometimes it's really unlike situation to have everyone to come to agreement, especially if the team is very big. So they put relationships over efficiency again. So they need to communicate with all the people and to make uh, everyone comfortable. But sometimes it's really impossible or if the company is big uh, and the decision should be made fast. And they can take a stand. So, but the leader really should take a stand, should, have, should make a decision and then act upon it. Because uh, if the leader doesn't take a stand, then someone else will. And it will be the leader. Uh, well, so we have described briefly all those four styles. Let's see how they are correlated with each other. So maybe it's not that visible in the, in the back, but the, the presentation, uh, the slides are available at the DrupalCon the, uh, website, uh, the page of my session. So there are four dimensions with which we can compare those styles, which is focus, perspective, speed, and approach. So focus can be result-oriented or process-oriented. Perspective can be global or local. Speed can be slow or fast. Uh, and the approach can be structured or unstructured. So I guess it's obvious that organization need to uh, have all the extents of those dimensions in order to develop. So for example, you need to think globally to come up with a viable strategy, but you need to act locally to implement it. And uh, you need to produce results but you cannot do it, or at least you cannot scale it up uh, if you don't have well-built processes. And it's a hardly a situation when one person can combine all the extents of all those dimensions in oneself, and therefore, uh, to manage the organization efficiently, the complementary team is needed. The complementary team that will combine all those four styles uh, in order to benefit from their common, uh, from their collective strength. But to manage those team of different individuals, who needs, uh, who is needed? The leader who is acting like a thumb and brings all those four styles to work together. And uh, that's why the appreciation of difference is that important. Only in this case, the team will benefit from the collective strengths. Uh, and uh, all of those styles have their own strong sides. But uh, unfortunately, all of them don't really matter if uh, people cannot communicate with each other, cannot build a good team. So therefore, I would propose a general recommendation to representatives of all styles is for producer, administrator, and the uh, entrepreneur to develop empathy because they all need it, of course, due to different reasons. The producer needs empathy to uh, work with the team properly, to delegate properly. Uh, the administrator needs uh, to have empathy to uh, put people over the procedures. And the entrepreneur needs empathy to listen to others. And as, uh, what about the integrator? I won't say the integrator should stop being empathetic at all. Of course not, but the integrator should balance the empathy because some yes people's feelings are important no one will argue that but sometimes in different situations it's not the most important things uh, and integrator should take a stand and act upon it so uh, actually uh, those descriptions of leadership styles and those recommendations are very brief and there are much more details about each and every styles and the lists of recommendations to representatives of different styles and also lists of recommendations to how to communicate with different leadership styles. So if you uh, want to know more about your style or style with your colleagues, uh, I've created a blog post which has very detailed uh, description of all this because we're now we're limited on time and I cannot tell you all I want, unfortunately. So you can, I will share with you the link further. So, uh, have you seen uh, some similarities with yourself or your colleagues in those leadership styles? Yeah, I see people nodding. But actually, for me, personally, it wasn't that easy to understand what, style, what leadership style I have just after reading the descriptions. So I complete the self-assessment test that is available on the Adesis Online Institute. I will also share with you a link that you can complete this test and be, be sure what style of leadership you demonstrate. Uh, 
So once you know what leadership style you demonstrate, you should go further to from self-assessment to self-development and see whether uh, uh, you can develop different style, other styles uh, for, to become a better leader to your team members. So I'm an entrepreneur, at least according to the test. And so you can imagine how much entrepreneur likes working with documents. So, but I decided that this is uh, the feature I want to develop in myself. This is a process I need to do because I know that it's important, even though I don't like it. So I decided to uh, develop in myself this part of administrator, uh, administrating style. Second question can be, uh, can you delegate parts of your work to your team members or to other representatives of your company? Uh, I also delegated some parts of my processes to my team members. And at first, uh, as for an entrepreneur, it was very hard to keep my mouth shut without telling them all the time how to do better, because I know how to do better, right? Uh, but I, now I'm glad that I let it go that time, because uh, I see that they're really managing it pretty well. And I'm really grateful for them to, for taking those parts of my responsibilities. And finally, look at your other team members and see, maybe you can build this complementary team that uh, really can uh, add value to each other. Well, so we have find out why we need to be leaders. We have described all the leadership styles. Uh, we drafted a strategy how we can develop other leadership styles in ourselves. Uh, so now let's see how to communicate with representatives of different styles. So this table uh, clear, clearly shows how different people react to such easy, simple words as yes and no. So for example, the producer, for him, uh, for producer, yes is yes and no is no. Producer is, is, is easy, but then it's not that easy anymore. So for administrator, yes is yes, but no is maybe. Which means that if administrator says you yes, uh, it says you know, I'm sorry. Uh, it means give me more data. And if you give the administrator more data, uh, they can say maybe or even yes. And for entrepreneur, on the other hand, yes is maybe. So if today the entrepreneur says yes, tomorrow it might be not even maybe. <laughs> it may be no. And for integrator, yes is maybe, no is also maybe, because integrator doesn't know what is yes and what is no until uh, the integrator consults with all the other team members. So of course, there are much more dimensions with which you can compare different styles and prepare yourself to communications with representatives of those different styles. For example, the dimension time focus. For producer, it is immediate. So producer focuses on what's going on right now, what tasks are urgent right now. So uh, administrator, uh, administrators look look in the past to data, to some researchers, to facts and stuff like this. Uh, entrepreneurs live in the future, in the future strategies, opportunities, new ideas, and stuff like this. And integrators uh, care about present. So, uh, do we have a compromise now? Is everything okay now? Uh, is there any conflict somewhere, and so on? And many other of them, so we won't stop uh, right now on each and every one of them, but if you, will, if you know that your uh, colleague or your boss is, for example, administrator, you just see what's important for the administrator and prepare yourself to the talk. Uh, well, then how to build this effective and efficient communication? So first you need to know yourself. Uh, you need to know why you why are you a leader, why you want to be a leader. Then you need to find out what leadership style you have. And then embrace all your strengths and all the areas of improvement you have. You need to know, actually, the, know this in order to improve it or develop it. And then you need to know your people. Talk to them, ask them why are they in your team. Why it is important to them to be in your team. And keep in mind that keep in mind that actually money or experience are not really the final answer, the final reason of people to do something. Just try to gently understand why your team members, for example, need money for. So some people need money to travel, some people need money to help parents. And those are two different motivations to be in your team. And two different approaches that leaders should demonstrate towards two different people. Um, because, uh, as I already told you, in this value-based approach, a leader should find uh, the way to connect personal goal of the team member to the project's goal in order to create a stronger commitment. Uh, 
then I'd also recommend you to test your team members and find out what their leadership styles are because it will help you to delegate more efficient. So for example, I bet uh, after this session you won't delegate the accounts in tasks to the entrepreneur. You would want the administrator to do your account. Uh, and finally, plan talks, team buildings, and education for your team members. I know many companies that provide education for team members. I know some companies that also provide team buildings. And maybe it's just me, but I know just a few companies that have structured uh, and well-built pro approach towards personal talks with uh, team members. But uh, I promise you, each minute spent on communicating with your team members will pay you back when it's time to get results. Because if people feel that you care about them, that you really uh, want them to unleash their potential through the project to show them the opportunity that they have, they will pay you back with commitment, with results, with loyalty. Uh, and the uh, team goes through different stages of its development from the f starting of the project till the end. And uh, on different stages of team development, different uh, support is needed from the leader. So, for example, at first stages, the uh, team members need a lot of education, they need a lot of team building, team bonding, and some very, you know, uh, intense periods of project realization. Some people might need emotional support or, again, uh, knowledge support and stuff like this. And uh, if you would be interested in planning this structured approach of this talks in buildings and educating your team based on the team development stages, I would suggest you to Google Tuckman's stages of team development. Uh, and here it's very basics of team management uh, where it's explained uh, how the team goes from forming to the adjoining stage. Uh, well, as I promised, the self-assessment test that, that I was talking about this full link uh, is available in the slides that are attached to my session page of the DrupalCon website. And there is a short link as well if you want to do it right now. It's bit.ly slash PAUI, PAUI test. And the blog post and Medium where there are much more detailed description of each and every styles and recommendations to all those different leadership styles. So, well, this is pretty it. Uh, that's all I wanted to share with you today. I'm really looking for feedback and ready to answer your questions. Well, if someone has questions, I, I guess in order it to be recorded, it should be asked in the microphone, right? Yeah. Well, any questions? I see. Is uh, this sort of testing and defining something you apply to every member of your team or organization or just a select group that are identified as the leaders of the organization? Uh -huh. Thank you for the question. Uh, how I work so uh, in, in my company, uh, in, not in my company, <laughs> sorry. So um, I have a team and I usually test the new initiatives on them and then if it's successful, I like, replicate success, uh, I try at least to replicate the success to other teams in my in, in the company. Uh, so now uh, I started to do this. So um, when I delegate some tasks, I see what the person is really, um, how to say, what's the, uh, what leadership style the person is demonstrating and I see whether it will be good to delegate this task to this person or no. So now I'm just seeing how it's working and it's working pretty well. So I guess in future we will be able to apply this to more teams in our company. And actually, um, uh, this um, PAEY model is based on the like basic works of Carl Jung, uh, which uh, and many models that come from this uh, very initial model have this four different leadership style. But the advantage of this model is that it's really, uh, let's say, understandable. So the, um, the advantage of it is that anyone in your company from the first day intern to CEO can understand and apply it. So it's, um, uh, it really worth uh, implementing. Uh, have I answered? Good. Any other questions? We have time. <laughs> 
Well, in case you don't have questions, uh, then thank you very much. I really appreciated this session and you coming uh, to hear what I'm gonna say. And yeah, if you have time just to submit feedback to my session, it will be really valuable to me. You can just do it personally or the page of my session at DrupalCon website. So thank you very much.